Hello, this is Larry Pond. I'm a CPA and certified financial planner. Welcome. And today we're going to talk about the American Families Plan. We heard President Biden speak to a joint session of Congress and to America on Wednesday, April 28th. And he covered a lot of topics. But today we're going to focus on the tax aspects of the American Families Plan. Here's a little slide about me and my background a little bit here. I'm in my 35th tax season, and boy, it's been a, a real challenging tax season. Also, um, in an earlier video that I recorded on the American Rescue Plan, I have a link uh, below that you can see that earlier video because a lot of the American Family Plan builds upon the American Rescue Plan also known as ARPA. So we're not going to repeat a lot of things that are mentioned in there, but uh, that's worth looking at also so you can have a more complete picture of what's going on. So here's what we're covering today. We're going to cover the tax aspects of the American Families Plan. We're not going to talk about all the other issues that President Biden talked about yesterday, but we're going to talk about just the tax aspects of it. Now, to let you know, though, this is not law yet. It has not been passed. Congress will need to write a bill and carry legislation through both houses of Congress and get a bill uh, on President Biden's desk for him to sign. So we don't know how long it's going to take. Will it be soon? Will it be a long time? Uh, will, will it get passed by the summer or the fall? We don't know. We don't know exactly. But the point of this is to get you informed so you'll know what's going on and you'll know what the president's talking about and what you hear on the news. So let's talk about the American Families Plan. First of all, we're going to go over the tax breaks, the Affordable Care Act premiums tax credit, the child tax credit, the child dependent care credit, and the earned income tax credit. So those are the breaks, <clears throat> but there are tax increases. <clears throat> Increase the top tax rate to 39.6%, increase the tax on capital gains for high earners, reducing the step of a basis in death, change taxation of carried interest, cut into the rule for like-kind exchanges, make the excess business loss rules permanent, and lose the loopholes on a 3.8% net investment income tax. And we'll close with some pending legislation that actually has been introduced in Congress. So let's first of all talk about the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare. So what the American Families Plan does is extends the expanded Affordable Care Act premiums tax credits that was brought in by ARPA, the American Rescue Plan. So what ARPA did was expanded the Section 36B premium credit that is available to many persons who are enrolled in an exchange purchase qualified healthcare plan. So in California, that's known as covered California. So this would apply if you have covered California. What this does is it reduces the health plan premiums and also expands the eligibility to people of income of more than 400% of the poverty line. Before that, if your income was over 400% of the poverty line, boom, you didn't get the premium tax credit at all. Or if you took a subsidy, you had to pay it back. <clears throat> and what ARPA did was this this applies to 21 and 22. What the American Family Plan is to make this expansion permanent. Now for 2020, if you took advantage of the subsidies for the Affordable Care Act and your income turned out to be too high, uh, normally you would have to pay it back. But for 2020, the requirement to pay back those subsidies have been waived. Now, if you filed your tax return, before the law changed, the IRS is supposed to refund that to you uh, sometime in May of 2021. So keep an eye out for that. But you'll need to look at your tax return to reconcile the numbers to see if they refunded the correct amount. So for 2020, for 2020 tax return, if you had to pay back a subsidy or pay back the premium tax credit, you didn't have to. Now for 21 and 22, we're not sure about that. That that's not mentioned here at all. So we'll we'll have to stay tuned to see if that will continue for 21 and 22 in terms of having to repay any subsidies. <clears throat> okay, the American Families Plan also extends the child tax credit increases that was introduced in ARPA through 2025 and make the child tax credit permanently fully refundable. 
So what ARPA did was expand the child tax credit from $2,000 per child to $3,000 per child. Now the credit is $3,600 per child uh, if the child's under age six. And also what ARPA did was includes 17 year olds are eligible uh, for the child tax credit for the first time. And the other big change is that it's fully refundable. So what does that mean? So that means, for example, let's say we have two kids, $6,000 credit, but your tax liability is $2,000. Under the old tax law, there's no refund. 2000 minus 2000 zero because it wasn't refundable. Now that it's refundable, starting in 2021, $6,000 credit, $2,000 tax liability. So 6,000 minus two equals a $4,000 refund. So it's fully refundable. Also, what's new is starting in July, <clears throat> the IRS will make advanced periodic payments of these credits, and they'll take the information off your 2020 tax return and, and start issuing checks or direct deposits starting in July. Also, the IRS will be setting up a portal for you to update your information. So let's say you have another child because in 21 because the IRS doesn't know about that, or your income's too high to qualify for this, so you don't want to have to pay back these payments uh, or anything like that. So, so we'll keep an eye out for the portal that the IRS is gonna put in there, but you will be getting checks starting in July. So the American Family Plan is gonna make this uh, um, increase continue through 2025 and fully refundable permanently. And continuing on in 2022, the credit will also be delivered regularly. So stay tuned, keep an eye out for that. Well, we'll stay tuned on this. Also, the AFP permanently increases the child dependent care credit. So what ARPA did was increase the child dependent care credit just for 21, but to permanently increase it. So the credit is increased from 35% to 50%, depending on your income, and qualifying expenses are increased from $3,000 to $8,000. And you have two or more children, that's $16,000. So we all know how much daycare costs, right? And also, if you're participating in your dependent care assistance program, where you have money taken out of your paycheck to pay for daycare, it's been increased to $10,500. Under the old law, it's $5,000. So make sure you check with your benefits administrator about this, if you're participating in this program. Or if you're not participating, see if you can sign up, because this could mean quite a bit. Now, what President Biden wants to do is also that you will pay no more than 7% of your income on child care if you have children under five years old. So I assume this will be done through the tax return. That's, that's my assumption. We'll see how that's going to be implemented, but that's, that's one of the goals here uh, on child care. If we have child care, we can work. That's all good, right? Also, to make the uh, expansion of the earned income tax credit to childless workers permanent. So ARPA introduced it um, for 2021, but to make it permanent. And what it does is it basically triples the amount of the earned income tax credit for childless workers. So again, another way of putting money in people's pockets. Now, those are the breaks. Let's talk about the tax increases. So number one is increase the individual top tax rate to 39.6%, which is the rate we had before the 2017 Tax Cut and Jobs Act was enacted. Because currently the top tax rate is 37%. So bring back the 39.6% for people of income over a million dollars. And the government says that only applies to the top 1% of people. So that's what they're saying. Also, the other tax increases increase the tax on capital gains for high earners. So if, if your household is making over a million dollars, which the government says is only the top 0.3% of all households, <clears throat> you'll be paying capital gains at 39.6%, the same rate on all your other income. So what this basically does is it equalizes the rate paid on investment returns and wages. There's some debate that um, <clears throat> why, why are people... Uh, earning wages, paying less tax than those just getting income from investments. So this was known as the Buffett rule because Warren Buffett noticed that his tax rate 
was lower than his secretaries. So that's why it's called the Buffett rule. And many politicians have been trying to implement the Buffett rule for, for over a decade now. Now, if you add the 3.8% surcharge, the net investment income tax, <clears throat> the combined top rate is now 43.4%. If you add state taxes to that, that's going to bring you up to more than 50% if your income is over a million dollars. What's the current law? The current law and capital gains rate is at zero, 15, or 20%, depending on your income. So most people are paying capital gains <clears throat> at 15%. So what does this mean for tax planning? You might want to take a look at your portfolio. We might want to take advantage of lower capital gains rates while we can um, before the tax rates go up. So it's something to look at in your portfolio. Last year, many people took significant amounts of capital gains because they were concerned about where the tax rates are going to go. So we saw that happen in 2020 quite a bit. So we, we shall see what this means. <clears throat> the other major tax increase could be reducing the step up in basis at the death for some taxpayers. So what's a step up in basis? So a step up in basis is when someone passes away, the property's basis gets stepped up. So for example, let's say you inherit a piece of property from your grandmother. She paid $100,000 to it, and that's her cost basis, $100,000, but it's worth a million dollars. So under the current law, there's a step up in basis. It was worth a million dollars when she died. You inherited it at a million dollars and you turn around and sold it. So a million minus a million is zero capital gains tax. Now, if we eliminate the step up in basis, then that might not be possible. Um, so the proposal is that the first million is tax-free, so anything over a million is taxable. If it's a uh, um, principal residence real estate, it could be $2.5 million per couple. So we'll see what the details of this works out to be. Now, the gains are, are taxable if you don't donate to charity. So if you give the property to charity, then, then there's not going to be any tax on the gains. Now, there's going to be protections in the legislation so that any family-owned businesses and farms will not have to pay taxes when given to heirs who continue to run the business. So if the family business and the farm stays in the family, then there, there, there um, shouldn't be any tax due at that time. Again, we'll need to see what the details look like. <clears throat> and also the other change in the estate gift and estate tax rates is to bring back 2009, go back to 2009. So the current exemption is $11,700,000. Bring that back to 3.5 million, possibly inflated to inflation. So it's going to be definitely more than that. Bring the tax rate from 40% currently to 45% and a $1 million lifetime gift exemption, $1 million. The other change, this has been talked about for the last five presidents, five presidents has been uh, more than a couple of decades is change in taxation of carried interest. So basically close the loophole so that hedge fund partners pay ordinary tax rates on their income. This has been brought up in every piece of tax legislation to force hedge fund partners, the folks in Wall Street mainly, to pay ordinary tax rates at 37% or 39.6% versus 20%. So they're paying tax on 20%. This has been discussed for many, many, many years, many, many times, and the lobby seems to be very effective of not making this change. So we'll see what happens with that. <clears throat> the other a big possible changes cut into the rule for like-kind exchanges. So what are like-kind exchanges? Um, a like-kind exchange is if I have a piece of rental real estate, and let's say it's worth a million dollars, and let's say the cost basis is $200,000, so if I sold it, that's an $800,000 gain. Well, instead of paying tax on that $800,000, I take that million dollars and roll it over into another piece of rental real estate, then I defer the $800,000 gain into the new property, no tax due. And this was talked about back in 2017 when the Tax Cut Jobs Act was being discussed. They were going to eliminate for, for all like-kind exchanges. But the real estate lobby did a good job of keeping it for real estate, but, but unfortunately, not for personal property. So you can't do like-kind exchanges of personal properties. So what are personal properties? The big ones are airplanes, ships, uh, 
uh, cars, cattle, um, those sorts of things where you can defer the game. And, and aircraft's a big deal because most of the time the aircraft is fully depreciated. So any dollar they sell it for, it'll be all game. So currently, only real estate qualifies for like and exchanges. There's a little bit of provision here. So if your gain is less than $500,000, you can still take advantage of this rule. So we'll see if this number changes or not. This will be very interesting. Uh, you can expect the, um, the National Association for Association of Realtors are opposed to this. And, and many real estate operators are opposed to this. So we'll see what happens with that. <clears throat> what are other tax increases possibly? Um, <clears throat> make the excess business loss rules permanent. Currently, they expire in 2026. So if you have excess business losses, those are disallowed. Increase the corporate tax rate from 21% to 28%. The top corporate used to be 35%. So many uh, people complain that makes the United States not competitive with other countries. And actually, 28% is the um, average corporate rate around the world. But there's a possibility of being negotiated down to 25% because if you add state taxes to it, it brings it up to 28% at least. So we'll see how that works out. The big discussion in the tax world right now is the global minimum tax rate. So set the global minimum tax for US multinationals at 21% based on book income, not taxable income, because there's a big difference with book income. A company might show a lot of profits, but because of tax breaks and all that, they might not show very much in uh, taxable income. Eliminate incentives to relocate overseas, prevent U.S. corporations from inverting, or locate in a tax haven. So that's that's uh, some discussions we had from the past. Close loopholes on a 3.8% net investment income tax. Um, and so I'm going to quote from the, uh, the, uh, the fact sheet here. Application of this provision is inconsistent across taxpayers due to holes in the law. It would apply to taxes consistently to those making over $400,000. I'm personally okay with that because it makes uh, uh, figuring out the tax returns a little more easier because there are some inconsistencies and we got to be really careful about those. Phase out the qualified business income deduction known as the 199A deduction, that's the 20% deduction on business income. The original version of this was for everything. Now it's just for income over $400,000. So that's a, a welcome change. Uh, your tax benefit for IMI's deductions. So cap the benefit at 28%. So what does that mean? So if you're in the 37% bracket and, and you have the itemized deductions, you get a 37% tax bracket. Well, this change will make it only worth 28%. Even though you're in a 39% bracket, let's say, you only get a 28% benefit. So what does that mean? Well, you might want to consider um, making your charitable contributions now to get the full benefit before that gets cut. So that, that's a thought to consider. Restore the P's limitations. And those were um, when your income's above a certain amount, you lost a, a, a portion of your IMS deductions. That disappeared as part of the 2017 Tax Cut and Jobs Act. Now, this would apply to people of income over $400,000. Eliminate expense deductions for offshoring of jobs. On the flip side, get a tax credit for onshoring jobs. Eliminate tax breaks for fossil fuel industries. And, and that can affect you personally because many of you are probably invested in those oil and gas limited partnerships. And that's, uh, uh, that gives us some pretty good tax breaks. And polluters are required to pay into the Superfund Trust Fund. Tax incentives for carbon recapture, sequestration, long distance transmission lines, sustainable aviation fuel, and increasing protections from droughts, wildfires, and floods. Expand tax credits for clean energy generation and storage and advanced energy products. So I know those last two are not tax increases, but those are actually tax breaks. We'll have to keep an eye on the details and how those are going to work and how you can take advantage of those. Now, that's the American Family Plan. Now, what's not in the American Family Plan is SALT, the SALT repeal. So there's more than 20 Democratic Congress members that said they're not going to vote for any tax package that does not include the repeal of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act $10,000 cap on state and local tax deduction. So for example, you, you pay state taxes, uh, 
uh, in your state, in California, you pay state taxes. You pay property taxes. Now you add those two numbers up, that's way more than $10,000. But under the current tax law, we can only deduct $10,000. So many people are very unhappy with that. So we'll see what happens with this. If, if there's going to be a, uh, adjustments or modification to the SALT repeal. But we'll see. This is going to be some um, interesting drama in Congress. We'll see what happens with that. But I think many of you are very pleased because I know many of you pay way more than $10,000 in state taxes and property taxes. Also, President Biden is proposing increasing IRS funding. Uh, IRS has had some significant budget cuts in the last few decades, significant billions of dollars of tax uh, budget cuts. Also, they're shorthanded by uh, at least 20,000 employees due to attrition and retirements and, and, and the pandemic didn't really help. So many people decided to take retirement. So they're shorthanded by 20,000 people. So President Biden wants to increase IRS funding by an additional $80 billion over the next tech 10 years to crack down on tax evasion by high earners and large corporations. Provide the IRS the resources it needs to stop sophisticated tax ev evasion, you know, hiring more people, getting the software and tools they need, which I have no problem with because my clients aren't the cheaters. It's the other people, right? Provide the IRS with more complete information. So what that means is on top of the 1099s they're getting from your financial institutions, the 1099 document might get expanded to include more information. So your financial institution might be required to give more information to the IRS and also uh, dealing with other countries. So uh, the IRS is getting documents from other countries uh, in terms of investments and those sorts of things. So they are getting that already, but it's going to expand upon that. The hot topic with this more complete information is cryptocurrency. So we're going to see more reporting on that, more regulation on cryptocurrency. Overhaul outdated technology to help the IRS identify tax evasion, improve taxpayer service and deliver tax credits. Right now, you're lucky if you can get to, through to them on the phone because a lot of times when, when we call, the phone line says, well, we have too many calls, call back another day. Or if you do get through, the wait time is probably a couple hours or so or even more. And also regulate paid tax preparers. I'm, I'm all for that too, because I, I think uh, taxes are incredibly complicated and it's important to stay on top of all the changes and all the rules, because there's a lot of unlicensed people out there preparing tax returns who don't know what they're doing. And then returns are incorrect or they're unscrupulous or they're stealing people's refunds. But I'm, I'm, I'm all for that. I'm, I'm all for the, the, the regulation. We, I have to do it anyway, because I'm regulated by the state of California and by the IRS. So no change to me. It's just that people aren't licensed. They will need to get a license. All for that. So let's close with uh, what's actually been proposed in Congress. So there's Senator Bernie Sanders. We all know who he is. He introduced a bill called For the 99.5% Act. This is an updated version of the bill he submitted back in 2019. That bill was called For the 99.8% Act. So I don't know why he changed the title to 99.5%. I guess that includes more people. Basically, it raises a state gift and GST taxes from 40% to 45% for people of three and a half million to 10 million, 50% if you're between 10 million and 50 million, 55% for 50 million to a billion. If you're over a billion dollars, you're lucky enough to have over a billion dollars, you get to pay 65% estate taxes. Exemptions reduced to 3.5 million, the gift tax exemptions reduced to a million. No valuation discounts. We can talk about that in another video. And currently, uh, annual exclusion gifts. You give fifteen thousand dollars to as many people as you like. Uh, if you have ten grandkids, each each grandkid get fifteen thousand dollars with no gift tax consequent. Under Senator Sanders' bill, the limit's going to be two gifts. And if you give more than two gifts, then it'll be taxable. So we'll see what that means and see how that's going to be implemented. But that's the For the 99.5% Act. It's been introduced in the Senate. And at the end, I have a link to that. The other bill that's out there, there are many other bills um, 
that we're not talking about here, but these are the ones that might affect you. So the other bill is introduced by Maryland Senator Chris Van Hollen. It's called the Sensible Taxation and Equity Act, Equity Promotion Act, known as STEP. So basically any transfer will trigger a capital gains tax. Basically, he just took a copy, just cut and pasted the Canadian tax law. This is similar to the Canadian system. Um, we get some breaks here. The first million is tax-free, and there's the initial $500,000 exclusion if it's a transfer of a home. He calls it a personal residence here. If, uh, if it's from a death, you, the family has 15 years to pay the tax, but it takes an effect January 1st of 21. So that's what Van Hollen's bill is about. So we'll have to stay tuned and, and see where that bill goes, if it goes anywhere, and if it makes it to the president's desk or not. So stay tuned, stay tuned. So here's the links to, the, uh, to, to, to this information here. So there's a link to the fact sheet on the American Families Plan that was introduced on April 28th by President Biden, White House, uh, investing in the IRS and improving tax compliance, that was issued by the Treasury and Senate Bill 994 for the 99.5% Act sponsored by Bernie Sanders. And um, here's an announcement from Senator Van Hollen, the Sensible Taxation and Equity Promotion Act of 2021. So thank you for your time today. We, we went over a lot of information. We talked about a lot of what's going on. So let's, uh, let's stay tuned uh, on what's going on in Congress and, and what, what might be happening to our taxes. So we're definitely going to give you an update as, as things move along and probably talk about what should I be doing? What should I be thinking about now? I probably wouldn't make radical changes to your tax planning, financial planning, or estate planning. I, I wouldn't do that right now, but it depends on your situation. We might recommend some changes. If, if you're charitably minded, you might want to consider taking advantage of that. You have a lot of capital gains. You might want to review your, your capital gains exposure and what that might be. Might want to take advantage of lower capital gains rates now. So those are two notable things that can happen. So, um, so we'll have to review the properties to see what's going on, and then we'll take, take a step from there. So thank you for your time, and I appreciate you listening. If you have any suggestions for more topics, uh, let me know. Thank you very much, and have a great day. Bye-bye.